Well, hello everyone. So a few months ago, uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia caused controversy, as she is wont to do, when she called for a national divorce. Basically, that kind of our in our polarized culture that the two sides would go their separate ways. So in this video, I'm going to talk about two other women that I know that I believe, to borrow the phrase from the Apostle Paul, showed a more excellent way. Let's get to it. So, hello everyone. This is Dennis Sanders. I'm the pastor of First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ of St. Paul, located in Roseville, Minnesota. I hope that you're having a great week. Happy May. It's finally spring here in Minnesota. So as I said in the lead in, Marjorie Taylor Greene made news a few months ago when she called for a national divorce. And she's hardly the only person that has opined that maybe it's time for our sharply divided nation to split up. Some, like Greene, think that this can be done amicably, amicably and some not so peacefully. Some are even talking about civil war. The last time, though, I think when Green talks about a national divorce and how it should be peaceful, the last time that we kind of had a divorce, um, it didn't really dis it result in one side getting the house. It, it kind of resulted in 700,000 people losing their lives. And that was in the aftermath of the civil war. Now, I don't think that we as a nation are headed towards that type of a divorce. But the zeitgeist, the spirit of our age, is one where we just don't get along. We don't even want to get along with those that we disagree with and with whom we have profound differences. But I want to share a story, and I want to share a story of two women that I knew some 30 years ago who I think found a way to live together, even though they had sometimes diametrically opposed views. So 30 years ago, I was a member of a church in um, kind of downtown DC, Washington, DC. It was a large Baptist church. Um, and the way that it was constituted back then was kind of odd because it was, at least it would be odd today because it was a mixture of both evangelicals and liberal Christians. And it also had a lot of people from different parts of the world, from Latin America and from Asia. It was truly this kind of melange that you, that you very seldom see in our culture. Now, the church decided that they wanted to call a pastor to their already multi-pastor staff. It was going to be a part-time position. And they had chosen a woman that had great pastoral care skills. She was going to be a great addition to that, pat, to that staff. There was a catch, though. The problem was that, that there was controversy because she was very much staunchly in favor of inclusion of LGBTQ persons in the life of the church. And that made some of the evangelical members of the congregation nervous. So there was a special meeting of the church that was called. And I remember it was in the basement and it was um, during that debate, one of the women stood up to make her opinion known. And she was actually someone from the evangelical side of this church. And so she had what you would consider to be a traditional understanding of homosexuality. So, you probably could guess what she was going to say. And if you guessed that, you were wrong. She spoke in favor of calling this pastor. Because you see, the candidate and this woman, who had been actually already involved in the congregation for a few years, were good friends. They got to know each other. And they got to know each other in a way that was beyond the issues of the day. This woman stressed that the two did not see eye to eye on this issue. Never, nevertheless, this pastor was her good friend. And she believed 
that this woman was the right person for the job. And of course, the end of that story was this woman joined the staff and was part of the staff of this congregation for several years. What's interesting about this story is that I don't think it could happen today. Actually, I'm gonna be even more bolder. I don't think it would happen today. Churches like that one that I was a part of 30 years ago really don't exist anymore. And in fact, in the years since I left, the church in that form doesn't really, I think, exist as much anymore. It's more firmly planted on the more progressive side of kind of the spectrum. And I think like a lot of places, evangelicals and progressives that used to sometimes share the same space have sorted themselves out. They don't really know each other. And it makes it a whole lot easier to do what this, what this woman want, did not do, which is demonize other people. The 1990s was this time, especially for me, as I was slowly coming out, that mainline Protestant churches were all grappling with the issue of homosexuality. And I remember hearing stories that in congregations that I either visited or were a part of that they were all discerning this issue. And there were people on various sides of the issue and they would all talk and, and sometimes they would actually come to a vote to decide things like where they're gonna become open and an open and affirming congregation. And after that difficult vote, someone somewhere would say this something to the effect of, and now we have some healing to do. The people had their views on the issue, but the emphasis when they talked to, when someone said this about healing was that it was important for the body, the, the grouping that was together to also be healed, to come together, that that mattered. There was a sense that the other side might be wrong on the issue. They may disagree with them sharply, but they never viewed them as evil. Now, the differences that we have now over ideology, sexuality, and race, those things were there 30 years ago. It's not like they just appeared. But I think that back then there was more opportunity for us to mix, for us to meet each other, for us to see each other, for us to actually maybe see each other as a child of God. But in our modern society, which is much more self-selected, we basically can pick our own friends. We don't have to try to build bridges with people that we don't agree with. And we live in those kind of information bubbles where we only get the news that we agree with. So now it's fairly easy to demonize anyone that we think is different and that disagrees. So why am I telling this story? Well, because I wish that we could revive what those two women, two women taught me 30 years ago, that we could find a way of agreeing without, to do disagree without being disagreeable. Civility used to be this civic value. It used to be something that we lived up to. And now we don't. In fact, we view it with some suspicion that it might be actually a way of perpetuating injustice. And I don't doubt that there are times that that could happen. But I want to lift up that as Christians, we're also supposed to respect and honor one another, even people that we disagree with, that we find ways to still care for each other, even when we disagree. I sometimes wonder why has this all happened? Why have we become so angry towards one another? Why have we not, are not willing to learn from one another? Why are we not willing to cross boundaries? I think that there are a lot of reasons and um, they probably take too long here to describe and this video is probably already long enough. What I can say is that the loss of institutions in our society are sorting 
into like-minded communities, both in real life and in online, have made, and that, and then throw in that politics has become a religion and an identity, have all contributed to this point where we no longer feel that we have to respect that other person that we may not always see eye to eye with. We cannot, we don't have to like that person that isn't a part of the tribe. I shared a few, I've shared over the last few weeks this story and I feel like I need to share it again because I feel like so we don't see this as much anymore. But Sharon Watkins was the former general minister and president of my denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And during the time when we were coming to terms with the issue on sexuality, she talked about the importance of staying at the table. She wasn't talking about a dinner table. She wasn't talking about any other type of table, not a breakfast table, but a communion table that we have to stay at the table with people that we don't agree with. And that's hard. It's hard to be at a table with someone that you may not always see eye to eye, especially on issues of sexuality, especially when there are people who might see that, if, especially if you're gay, that what you're doing is sinful. That's hard. And you don't want to do something that will also basically kind of do damage to your soul. But that also doesn't mean that we get to stay in our safe boxes and never encounter people who are different and never try to see someone who disagrees with as a child of God. The thing is, is that we stay at the table because it's God's table, not ours. This table is God's, and God has created everyone, even the people that we don't agree with, even the people that we can't stand. Every Sunday, as disciples, we gather around this communion table, and that table is a powerful symbol in disciple theology, because it is a place where God calls everyone, no matter their ideology, no matter their race, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their gender, no matter their sexuality. The table calls all of us because we are all children of God. We are all sinners. We are all in need of grace. And maybe that is what we need as a society, is to, as, especially as Christians, to understand that we are a people of the table before we are anything else. Because it is God that calls us to the table. God, through Jesus Christ, calls us here to be together. Can we take that image that we have of the communion table and make it part of our lives, not just in church, but every day and in everyone that we meet and try to meet? You know, I still wonder, I wonder at times, what these two women are doing now. It's been 30 years. Maybe they've gone on their separate ways, but I'd like to think that they're still close friends. Maybe they still live close to each other in DC. Maybe they live in separate parts of the country. But I like to think that they're still in contact, sharing their lives, trying to love one another especially in a time when loving someone outside of the tribe seems so dangerous. That's my wish and my hope for them. But you know what? It's not really just my wish and hope for them. It's my wish and hope for all of us. For the sake of the nation, for the sake of our world, for the sake of our church. I thank God for these two women. And may God continue to find ways to bring us together and to stay at the table. Take care, everyone. I'll see you soon.